Capit, Part 1 of 3 By Karl Marx Audiobook 47x55 The mere sense that they exist subject to this species of ban, on the, par on the part of the landlords and their agents, has, given birth in the minds of the laborers to corresponding sentiments of antagonism and dissatisfaction towards those by whom they are thus led to regard themselves are being treated as, a proscribed race. The first act of the agricultural revolution was to sweep away the huts situated on the field of labor. This was done on the largest scale, and as if in obedience to a command from on high. Thus many laborers were compelled to seek shelter in villages and towns. There they were thrown like refuse into garrets, holes, cellars, and corners, in the worst back slums. Thousands of Irish families, who according to the testimony of the English, eaten up as these are with national prejudice, are notable for their rare attachment to the domestic hearth, for their gaiety and the purity of their home life, found themselves suddenly transplanted into hotbeds of vice. The men are now obliged to seek work of the neighboring farmers and are only hired by the day, and therefore under the most precarious forms of wage. Hence they sometimes have long distances to go to and from work, often get wet, and suffer much hardship, not unfrequently ending in sickness, disease, and want. The towns have had to receive from year to year what was deemed to be the surplus labor of the rural division, and then people still wonder there is still a surplus of labor in the towns and villages, and either a scarcity or a threatened scarcity in some of the country divisions. The truth is that this want only becomes perceptible in harvest time, or during spring, or at such times as agricultural operations are carried on with activity, at other periods of the year many hands are idle, that from the digging out of the main crop of potatoes in October until the early spring following, there is no employment for them, and further, that during the active times they are subject to broken days and to all kinds of interruptions. These results of the agricultural revolution, i.e., the change of arable into pasture land, the use of machinery, the most rigorous economy of labor, 8c, are still further aggravated by the model landlords, who, instead of spending their rents in other countries, condescend to live in Ireland on their domains. In order that the law of supply and demand may not be broken, these gentlemen draw their labor supply, chiefly from their small tenants, who are obliged to attend when required to do the landlord's work, at rates of wages, in many instances, considerably under the current rates paid to ordinary laborers, and without regard to the inconvenience or loss to the tenant of being obliged to neglect his own business at critical periods of sowing or reaping. The uncertainty and irregularity of employment, the constant return and long duration of gluts of labor, all these symptoms of a relative surplus population, figure therefore in the reports of the poor law administration, as so many hardships of the agricultural proletariat. It will be remembered that we met, in the English agricultural proletariat, with a similar spectacle. But the difference is that in England, an industrial country, the industrial reserve recruits itself from the country districts, whilst in Ireland, an agricultural country, the agricultural reserve recruits itself from the towns, the cities of refuge of the expelled agricultural laborers. In the former, the supernumeraries of agriculture are transformed into factory operatives, in the latter, those forced into the towns, whilst at the same time they press on the wages in towns, remain agricultural laborers, and are constantly sent back to the country districts in search of work. The official inspectors sum up the material condition of the agricultural laborer as follows. Though living with the strictest frugality, his own wages are barely sufficient to provide food for an ordinary family and pay his rent, and he depends upon other sources for the means of clothing himself, his wife, and children, the atmosphere of these cabins, combined with the other privations they are subjected to, has made this class particularly susceptible to low fever and pulmonary consumption. After this, it is no wonder that, according to the unanimous testimony of the inspectors, 
a somber discontent runs through the ranks of this class, that they long for the return of the past, loathe the present, despair of the future, give themselves up to, to the evil influence of agitators, and have only one fixed idea, to emigrate to America. This is the land of Kokan, into which the great Malthusian panacea, depopulation, has transformed Green Erin. What a happy life the Irish factory operative leads, one example will show. On my recent visit to the north of Ireland, says the English factory inspector, Robert Baker, I met with the following evidence of effort in an Irish skilled workman to afford education to his children, and I give his evidence verbatim, as I took it from his mouth. That he was a skilled factory hand, may be understood when I say that he was employed on goods for the Manchester market. Johnson I am a beetler and work from 6 in the morning till 11 at night, from Monday till Friday. Saturday we leave off at 6 p.m. and get three hours of it, for meals and rest. I have five children in all. For this work I get tens. 6 d. A week, my wife works here also, and gets fives. A week. The oldest girl who is 12, minds the house. She is also cook, and all the servant we have. She gets the young ones ready for school. A girl going past the house wakes me at half past five in the morning. My wife gets up and goes along with me. We get nothing, to eat, before we come to work. The child of twelve takes care of the little children all the day, and we get nothing till breakfast at eight. At eight we go home. We get tea once a week, at other times we get stir about, sometimes of oatmeal, sometimes of Indian meal, as we are able to get it. In the winter we get a little sugar and water to our Indian meal. In the summer we get a few potatoes, planting a small patch ourselves, and when they are done we get back to stir about. Sometimes we get a little milk as it may be. So we go on from day to day, Sunday and weekday, always the same the year round. I am always very much tired when I have done at night. We may see a bit of flesh meat sometimes, but very seldom. Three of our children attend school for whom we pay 1d. A week ahead. Our rent is 9d. A week. Peat fur firing costs 1s. 6d. A fortnight at the very lowest. Such are Irish wages, such is Irish life. In fact the misery of Ireland is again the topic of the day in England. At the end of 1866 and the beginning of 1867, one of the Irish land magnates, Lord Dufferin, set about its solution in the Times. We menschlich von solch grossem Herrn. From Table E. We saw that, during 1864, of four million three hundred and sixty-eight thousand six hundred and ten pounds of total profits, Three surplus value makers pocketed only £262,610, that in 1865, however, out of £4,669,979 total profits, the same three virtuosi of abstinence pocketed £274,448, in 1864. 26 surplus value makers reached to 646,377 pounds, in 1865, 28 surplus value makers reached to 736,448 pounds, in 1864, 121 surplus value makers, 1,066,912 pounds, in 1865, 186 surplus value makers, 1,320,996 pounds. In 1864, 1,131 surplus value makers, 2,150,818 pounds, nearly half of the total. Annual profit, 
in 1865, 1194 surplus value makers £2,418,933, more than half of the total annual profit. But the lion's share, which an inconceivably small number of land magnates in England, Scotland and Ireland swallow up of the yearly national rental, is so monstrous that the wisdom of the English state does not think fit to afford the same statistical materials about the distribution of rents as about the distribution of profits. Lord Dufferin is one of those land magnates. That rent rolls and profits can ever be excessive, or that their plethora is in any way connected with plethora of the people's misery is, an idea as disreputable as unsound. He keeps to facts. The fact is that, as the Irish population diminishes, the Irish rent rolls swell, that depopulation benefits the landlords, therefore also benefits the soil, and, therefore the people, that were accessory of the soil. He declares, therefore, that Ireland is still overpopulated, and the stream of emigration still flows too lazily. To be perfectly happy, Ireland must get rid of at least one-third of a million of labouring men. Let no man imagine that this lord, poetic into the bargain, is a physician of the school of Sangrado, who as often as he did not find his patient better, ordered phlebotomy and again phlebotomy, until the patient lost his sickness at the same time as his blood. Lord Dufferin demands a new bloodletting of one-third of a million only, instead of about two millions, in fact, without the getting rid of these, the millennium in Erin is not to be. The proof is easily given. Centralization has from 1851 to 1861 destroyed principally farms of the first three categories, under one and not over fifteen acres. These above all must disappear. This gives 307,058 supernumerary farmers, and reckoning the families the low average of four persons 1,228,232 persons. On the extravagant supposition that, after the agricultural revolution is complete, one-fourth of these are again absorbable, there remain for emigration 921,174 persons. Categories, 4, 5, 6, of over 15 and not over 100 acres, are, as was known long since in England, too small for capitalistic cultivation of corn, and for sheep breeding are almost vanishing quantities. On the same supposition as before, therefore, there are further 788,761 persons to emigrate, total, 1,709,532. And as L. Apeti Vint and Mangent, Rentrol's eyes will soon discover that Ireland, with three one half millions, is still always miserable because she is overpopulated. Therefore, her depopulation must go yet further, that thus she may fulfill her true destiny, that of an English sheep walk and cattle pasture. Like all good things in this bad world, this profitable method has its drawbacks. With the accumulation of rents in Ireland, the accumulation of the Irish in America keeps pace. The Irishman, banished by sheep and ox, reappears on the other side of the ocean as a Fenian, and face to face with the old queen of the sea rises, threatening, and more threatening, the young giant republic. Acerba Fatarumanos against Alusk Fraterni Nisus. Part 8 The So-Called Primitive Accumulation Chapter XXVI The Secret of Primitive Accumulation We have seen how money is changed into capital, how through capital surplus value is made, and from surplus value more capital. But the accumulation of capital presupposes surplus value, surplus value presupposes capitalistic production, capitalistic production presupposes the pre-existence of considerable masses of capital and of labor power in the hands of producers of commodities. The whole movement, therefore, seems to turn in a vicious circle, out of which we can only get by supposing a primitive accumulation, previous accumulation of Adam Smith, preceding capitalistic accumulation, 
an accumulation not the result of the capitalist mode of production, but its starting point. This primitive accumulation plays in political economy about the same part as original sin in theology. Adam bit the apple, and thereupon sin fell on the human race. Its origin is supposed to be explained when it is told as an anecdote of the past. In times long gone by there were two sorts of people, one, the diligent, intelligent, and, above all, frugal elite, the other, lazy rascals, spending their substance, and more, in riotous living. The legend of the logical original sin tells us certainly how man came to be condemned to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow, but the history of economic original sin reveals to us that there are people to whom this is by no means essential. Never mind. Thus it came to pass that the former sort accumulated wealth, and the latter sort had at last nothing to sell except their own skins. And from this original sin dates the poverty of the great majority that, despite all its labor, has up to now nothing to sell but itself, and the wealth of the few that increases constantly although they have long ceased to work. Such insipid childishness is every day preached to us in the defense of property. M. Tier, e.g., had the assurance to repeat it with all the solemnity of a statesman, to the French people, once so spirituel. But as soon as the question of property crops up, it becomes a sacred duty to proclaim the intellectual food of the infant as the one thing fit for all ages and for all stages of development. In actual history it is notorious that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, briefly force, play the great part. In the tender annals of political economy, the idyllic reigns from all time immemorial. Right and labor were from all time the sole means of enrichment, the present year of course always accepted. As a matter of fact, the methods of primitive accumulation are anything but idyllic. In themselves, money and commodities are no more capital than are the means of production and of subsistence. They want transforming into capital. But this transformation itself can only take place under certain circumstances that center in this, viz., that two very different kinds of commodity possessors must come face to face and into contact, on the one hand, the owners of money, means of production, means of subsistence, who are eager to increase the sum of values they possess, by buying other people's labor power, on the other hand, free laborers, the sellers of their own labor power, and therefore the sellers of labor. Free laborers, in the double sense that neither they themselves form part and parcel of the means of production, as in the case of slaves, bondsmen, 8c, nor do the means of production belong to them, as in the case of peasant proprietors, they are, therefore, free from, unencumbered by, any means of production of their own. With this polarization of the market for commodities, the fundamental conditions of capitalist production are given. The capitalist system presupposes the complete separation of the laborers from all property in the means by which they can realize their labor. As soon as capitalist production is once on its own legs, it not only maintains this separation, but reproduces it on a continually extending scale. The process, therefore, that clears the way for the capitalist system, can be none other than the process which takes away from the laborer the possession of his means of production, a process that transforms, on the one hand, the social means of subsistence and of production into capital, on the other, the immediate producers into wage laborers. The so-called primitive accumulation, therefore, is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production. It appears as primitive, because it forms the prehistoric stage of capital and of the mode of production corresponding with it. The economic structure of capitalistic society has grown out of the economic structure of feudal society. The dissolution of the latter set free the elements of the former. The immediate producer, the laborer, could only dispose of his own person after he had ceased to be attached to the soil and ceased to be the slave, serf, or bondman of another. To become a free seller of labor power, 
who carries his commodity wherever he finds a market, he must further have escaped from the regime of the guilds, their rules for apprentices and journeymen, and the impediments of their labor regulations. Hence, the historical movement which changes the producers into wage workers, appears, on the one hand, as their emancipation from serfdom and from the fetters of the guilds, and this side alone exists for our bourgeois historians. But, on the other hand, these new freedmen became sellers of themselves only after they had been robbed of all their own means of production, and of all the guarantees of existence afforded by the old feudal arrangements. And the history of this, their expropriation, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. The industrial capitalists, these new potentates, had on their part not only to displace the guild masters of handicrafts, but also the feudal lords, the possessors of the sources of wealth. In this respect their conquest of social power appears as the fruit of a victorious struggle both against feudal lordship and its revolting prerogatives, and against the guilds and the fetters they laid on the free development of production and the free exploitation of man by man. The Chevaliers d'Industry, however, only succeed in supplanting the Chevaliers of the Sword by making use of events of which they themselves were wholly innocent. They have risen by means as vile as those by which the Roman freedman once on a time made himself the master of his patroness. The starting point of the development that gave rise to the wage laborer as well as to the capitalist, was the servitude of the laborer. The advance consisted in a change of form of this servitude, in the transformation of feudal exploitation into capitalist exploitation. To understand its march, we need not go back very far. Although we come across the first beginnings of capitalist production as early as the 14th or 15th century, sporadically, in certain towns of the Mediterranean, the capitalistic era dates from the 16th century. Wherever it appears, the abolition of serfdom has been long effected, and the highest development of the Middle Ages, the existence of sovereign towns, has been long on the wane. In the history of primitive accumulation, all revolutions are epoch-making that act as levers for the capitalist class in course of formation, but, above all, those moments when great masses of men are suddenly and forcibly torn from their means of subsistence, and hurled as free and unattached proletarians on the labor market. The expropriation of the agricultural producer, of the peasant, from the soil, is the basis of the whole process. The history of this expropriation, in different countries, assumes different aspects, and runs through its various phases in different orders of succession, and at different periods. In England alone, which we take as our example, has it the classic form. Chapter XXVII Expropriation of the Agricultural Population from the Land In England, serfdom had practically disappeared in the last part of the 14th century. The immense majority of the population consisted then, and to a still larger extent, in the 15th century, of free peasant proprietors, whatever was the feudal title under which their right of property was hidden. In the larger seigneurial domains, the old bailiff, himself a serf, was displaced by the free farmer. The wage laborers of agriculture consisted partly of peasants, who utilized their leisure time by working on the large estates, partly of an independent special class of wage laborers, relatively and absolutely few in numbers. The latter also were practically at the same time peasant farmers, since, besides their wages, they had allotted to them arable land to the extent of four or more acres, together with their cottages. Besides they, with the rest of the peasants, enjoyed the usufruct of the common land, which gave pasture to their cattle, furnished them with timber, firewood, turf, etc. In all countries of Europe, feudal production is characterized by division of the soil amongst the greatest possible number of sub-feudatories. The might of the feudal lord, like that of the sovereign, depended not on the length of his rent roll, but on the number of his subjects, and the latter depended on the number of peasant proprietors. Although, 
therefore, the English land, after the Norman conquest, was distributed in gigantic baronies, one of which often included some 900 of the old Anglo-Saxon lordships, it was bestrewn with small peasant properties, only here and there interspersed with great seigneurial domains. Such conditions, together with the prosperity of the towns so characteristic of the 15th century, allowed of that wealth of the people which Chancellor Fortescue so eloquently paints in his Lods Legum Anglii, but it excluded the possibility of capitalistic wealth. The prelude of the revolution that laid the foundation of the capitalist mode of production, was played in the last third of the 15th, and the first decade of the 16th century. A mass of free proletarians was hurled on the labor market by the breaking up of the bands of feudal retainers, who, as Sir James Stoyart well says, everywhere uselessly filled house and castle. Although the royal power, itself a product of bourgeois development, in its strife after absolute sovereignty forcibly hastened on the dissolution of these bands of retainers, it was by no means the sole cause of it. In insolent conflict with king and parliament, the great feudal lords created an incomparably larger proletariat by the forcible driving of the peasantry from the land, to which the latter had the same feudal right as the lord himself, and by the usurpation of the common lands. The rapid rise of the Flemish wool manufactures, and the corresponding rise in the price of wool in England, gave the direct impulse to these evictions. The old nobility had been devoured by the great feudal wars. The new nobility was the child of its time, for which money was the power of all powers. Transformation of arable land into sheep walks was, therefore, its cry. Harrison, in his description of England, prefixed to Holland Shed's Chronicle, describes how the expropriation of small peasants is ruining the country. What care are great encroachers? The dwellings of the peasants and the cottages of the laborers were razed to the ground or doomed to decay. If, says Harrison, the old records of Uri Manure be sought, it will soon appear that in some manure seventeen, eighteen, or twenty houses are shrunk, that England was no or less furnished with people than at the present, of cities and towns either utterly decayed or more than a quarter or half diminished though someone be a little increased here or there, of towns pulled down for sheep walks, and no more but the lordships now standing in them, I could sigh somewhat. The complaints of these old chroniclers are always exaggerated, but they reflect faithfully the impression made on contemporaries by the revolution in the conditions of production. A comparison of the writings of Chancellor Fortescue and Thomas More reveals the gulf between the 15th and 16th century. As Thornton rightly has it, the English working class was precipitated without any transition from its golden into its iron age. Legislation was terrified at this revolution. It did not yet stand on that height of civilization where the wealth of the nation, i.e., the formation of capital, and the reckless exploitation and impoverishing of the mass of the people, figure as the ultima thule of all statecraft. In his History of Henry VII, Bacon says. In closures at that time, 1489, began to be more frequent, whereby arable land, which could not be manured without people and families, was turned into pasture, which was easily rid by a few herdsmen, and tenancies for years, lives, and at will, whereupon much of the yeomanry lived, were turned into demonses. This bred a decay of people, and, by consequence, a decay of towns, churches, tithes, and the like, in remedying of this inconvenience the king's wisdom was admirable, and the parliament at that time, they took a course to take away depopulating enclosures, and depopulating pasturage. An Act of Henry VII, 1489, ca forbade the destruction of all houses of husbandry to which at least twenty acres of land belonged. By an Act, 25 Henry VIII, the same law was renewed. It recites, among other things, that many farms and large flocks of cattle, especially of sheep, are concentrated in the hands of a few men, 
whereby the rent of land has much risen and tillage has fallen off, churches and houses have been pulled down, and marvelous numbers of people have been deprived of the means wherewith to maintain themselves and their families. The Act, therefore, ordains the rebuilding of the decayed farmsteads, and fixes a proportion between corn land and pasture land, 8 c. An Act of 1533 recites that some owners possess 24,000 sheep, and limits the number to be owned to 2,000. The cry of the people and the legislation directed, for 150 years after Henry VII, against the appropriation of the small farmers and peasants, were alike fruitless. The secret of their inefficiency Bacon, without knowing it, reveals to us. The device of King Henry VII, says Bacon, in his Essays, Civil and Moral, Essay 29, was profound and admirable, in making farms and houses of husbandry of a standard, that is, maintained with such a proportion of land unto them as may breed a subject to live in convenient plenty, and no servile condition, and to keep the plough in the hands of the owners and not mere hirelings. What the capital system demanded was, on the other hand, a degraded and almost servile condition of the mass of the people, the transformation of them into mercenaries, and of their means of labor into capital. During this transformation period, legislation also strove to retain the four acres of land by the cottage of the agricultural wage laborer, and forbade him to take lodgers into his cottage. In the reign of James I. 1627, Roger Crocker of Front Mill, was condemned for having built a cottage on the manor of Front Mill without four acres of land attached to the same Indiana perpetuity. As late as Charles I.S. Reign, 1638, a royal commission was appointed to enforce the carrying out of the old laws, especially that referring to the four acres of land. Even in Cromwell's time, the building of a house within four miles of London was forbidden unless it was endowed with four acres of land. As late as the first half of the 18th century complaint is made if the cottage of the agricultural laborer has not an adjunct of one or two acres of land. Nowadays he is lucky if it is furnished with a little garden, or if he may rent, far away from his cottage, a few roots. Landlords and farmers, says Drive. Hunter, work here hand in hand. A few acres to the cottage would make the laborers too independent. The process of forcible expropriation of the people received in the 16th century a new and frightful impulse from the Reformation, and from the consequent colossal spoliation of the church property. The Catholic Church was, at the time of the Reformation, feudal proprietor of a great part of the English land. The suppression of the monasteries, 8 c, hurled their inmates into the proletariat. The estates of the church were to a large extent given away to rapacious royal favorites, or sold at a nominal price to speculating farmers and citizens, who drove out, en masse, the hereditary subtenants and threw their holdings into one. The legally guaranteed property of the poorer folk in a part of the church's tithes was tacitly confiscated. Pauper ubique jacet, cried Queen Elizabeth, after a journey through England. In the 43rd year of her reign the nation was obliged to recognize pauperism officially by the introduction of a poor rate. The authors of this law seem to have been ashamed to state the grounds of it, for contrary to traditional usage it has no preamble whatever. By the 16th of Charles I, ch. 4, it was declared perpetual, and in fact only in 1834 did it take a new and harsher form. These immediate results of the Reformation were not its most lasting ones. The property of the Church formed the religious bulwark of the traditional conditions of landed property. With its fall these were no longer tenable. Even in the last decade of the 17th century, the yeomanry, the class of independent peasants, were more numerous than the class of farmers. They had formed the backbone of Cromwell's strength, and, even according to the confession of Macaulay, 
stood in favourable contrast to the drunken squires and to their servants, the country clergy, who had to marry their masters' cast-off mistresses. About 1750, the yeomanry had disappeared, and so had, in the last decade of the 18th century, the last trace of the common land of the agricultural labourer. We leave on one side here the purely economic causes of the agricultural revolution. We deal only with the forcible means employed. After the restoration of the Stuarts, the landed proprietors carried, by legal means, an act of usurpation, effected everywhere on the continent without any legal formality. They abolished the feudal tenure of land, i.e., they got rid of all its obligations to the state, indemnified the state by taxes on the peasantry and the rest of the mass of the people, vindicated for themselves the rights of modern private property in estates to which they had only a feudal title, and, finally, passed those laws of settlement, which, mutatis mutandis, had the same effect on the English agricultural labourer, as the edict of the Tartar Boris Godunov on the Russian peasantry. The glorious revolution brought into power, along with William of Orange, the landlord and capitalist appropriators of surplus value. They inaugurated the new era by practicing on a colossal scale thefts of state lands, thefts that had been hitherto managed more modestly. These estates were given away, sold at a ridiculous figure, or even annexed to private estates by direct seizure. All this happened without the slightest observation of legal etiquette. The crown lands thus fraudulently appropriated, together with the robbery of the church estates, as far as these had not been lost again during the Republican Revolution, form the basis of the today princely domains of the English oligarchy. The bourgeois capitalists favoured the operation with the view, among others, to promoting free trade in land, to extending the domain of modern agriculture on the large farm system, and to increasing their supply of the free agricultural proletarians ready to hand. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.